Here we go. Let's get crazy. Oh, Emma. Welcome to another episode of Emma's Bunker. I'm Emma. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Just just before we get into the episode today, I appreciate you listening and especially appreciate you if you have rated and reviewed on iTunes. My confidence in, is in the gutter, but it's also I feel really like calm and comfortable with myself, but also it's in the total gutter. So that makes me feel better when I get a rate and review, even though it shouldn't. And yet it should. People are always like, you shouldn't care what other people think. I'm like, okay, then I'm going to put Oreos in my butt. If we're being honest, I just want to take a moment to give a shout out to anybody with kids because I have two dogs and they're driving me fucking nuts. And I know there's a difference. I know dogs poop more than children. I'm sure there's other, maybe not even. I don't know how you do it with kids. I really don't. And keep a marriage and a career. How do you do it? Is it just, do you just get re-energized? And the breathing, I'm sure dogs and kids breathe differently and I hope you can't hear one of the dogs panting but the dog that's 14 and pants also has an eating disorder which I didn't know dogs could also have no judgments full respect there but she breathes like she's inventing hepatitis it's like someone who got locked away for something really perverted they were jacking off to ostriches in snowsuits and they were going to the park and jacking off and they got locked away and they're in the jail and one of the wardens needs to be fired and they've been there a long time and they get their kicks out of bringing in a picture of an ostrich in a snowsuit but standing really far away so the prisoner with the perversion is squinting and the way that they're fucking breathing like ostrich in the snowsuit that's how she fucking breathes. Day in. And I'm gonna, she's right, hold on. She just stopped when I put the mic up to her. Now I feel bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chloe. I know you're old. Okay, she won't do it when the mic's on her. I'm just saying, I want to give a shout out to people with kids because just being responsible for stuff is hard. And who the fuck am I to be comparing dogs to kids? But I'm doing it. I feel awful. Part of me wants to edit this out, but then the other other part of me is, no, just let it all out. And I apologize for comparing my dogs to your children. I'll be more careful. So, today's guest, buddy of mine from New York, his name's John Laster. He was the winner of NBC's Stand Up for Diversity. John Laster? I've known John. (laughs) For fuck's sake! I wanted to find this joke of John's that he wrote. He ta- he talks about the origin story for the joke. The way he tells it on stage is about he ties it into his house burned down. And he was struggling. And this girl said to him, like, why don't you just call your dad? And I remember being like, yeah, call your dad. And then the whole joke is he's like, motherfucker, my dad owes me 50 bucks. What do you mean? Why don't you just call your dad? Like, they're going to blow the roof off with that that idea. So I was trying to find that. I couldn't find it. But I get that stuck in my head. Just call your dad. John was an athlete on track to play basketball profession. Didn't work out. And then he went from being a pro, almost pro, but a star athlete, to trying to make it in stand-up comedy, working his way up. And then he wins NBC's Stand Up for Diversity, which is a big thing. Oh, man, I remember auditioning for that. I auditioned for that a couple times. There's this one guy who was one of the judges. I could have sworn he was gay. So I'm doing it. And he's talking to me and I go, it's so nice there's a gay judge. And he looks at me and he goes, and who is that? And I was like, fuck me. And then I had to backtrack and be like, that that person over there that's nowhere near us or anything we've ever talked about. I, you're John won that. It's a big thing. He's been getting pressed recently for the John Laster Challenge. D.L. Hughley has been a part of it, and it's a challenge where black men will talk about their interactions with police. It's very powerful. Here's my conversation with John Laster. Can you hear me? Yes, what are you doing? How you doing? Good to see you. 
Yo, you have a whole green screen. I love it. Well, let me tell you something. I just set it up and wait, let me see if I can show you it without the thing. Because it's it's hanging on by a thread. Let's see. Oh, you can't okay, you can't really see it, but basically my bedroom's so messy and then I just I've just like got it like covered. I got the green screen because otherwise you'd see my bed and then I like was getting free vitamins from this vitamin company, so I ordered all these vitamins and then there's shit everywhere. So that's what that's what's going on. But um I'll hear, I'll start recording in a second, but um uh I'm in LA and I've become like obsessed with watching the comedy scene here crumble. <laughs> like, really? yeah, because if you go on Reddit, like every, there's all this stuff happening in LA where it's just like dis. but it makes me appreciate New York comedy so much. Like the more I'm like reading about it's all this. The, the D'Elia stuff and. It's him. And then all there's um these two other, it, it's his openers then like other guys that he used to tour with. And then people are moving, you know, like Joe Rogan's moving um joey diaz is moving i think theo vaughn's moving so like all the it's like dismantling mm. but it's making me think about new york where's he moving to where's rogan moving to he's gonna move to texas oh okay all right i'll do the intro for you okay today i'm talking to comedian actor former athlete winner of nbc's stanford for diversity my buddy, John Laster. Hi, John. Uh, I totally forgot all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're getting intro and you're like, who? Who? <laughs> who is this? And they're like, coming to the stage. And you're like, who Who won that? I should it, was in, it was interesting researching you because, you know, we've known each other for a while. And I never knew that you were so into basketball. Oh, yeah. In another life, though. So. Yeah, I, I, that was another life. I played at um, Minnesota and Colorado State. It was a party. It was a good time. Yeah. I wanted to, before I ask you questions about you growing up, I wanted to first start with, because I've referenced your joke before about call your dad. I've actually told it pretty, I've, I've told it pretty, I, and I always say, I'm like, I'm paraphrasing. I can't do the whole thing. But then I say, and then he turns around. So John has a joke about, I call it the call, call your dad. And I'm going to play a little clip of it in the intro for you, but would you tell me about what your process was for writing that joke? Oh, you know what? Um, the call your dad joke, I was in bad shape financially. And mm. my ex-girlfriend, who just passed away. Um, really? From Corona? No, no. From, yeah, from alcoholism. Really? She, yeah yeah so we're 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 at the crib and she says she said yeah you know you know john because my you know i was complaining about my money's falling apart these i had lost a bunch of kids she was like why don't you just call your dad and i just remember steam shooting out of my ears do you know what i mean like what in the world so i go to this open mic and I wasn't trying to make it a joke. I was mad. So I just right. got on the stage and I was venting. I was like, yeah, I came to this mic. My money's messed up. And this, you know, my ex, she's white. She says, call your dad. And people just hit the floor, like fell out. The, the crazy part about that joke, though, was it was just that. That's all it was. Because mm -hmm. I was venting. I wasn't trying to work on it. I was just mad. Like, it was like, you need to get it out of the way before you get to what you want to talk about. Exactly. Yeah. And and a friend of mine named Tori Piskin was there. Sure. Some of her girlfriends. Yeah. Comedian out there in L.A. She's beyond talented. So Tori would see me sometimes at shows and be like, dude, you know, that day we were at that mic, she said, you have to do the call your dad joke. Hmm. And I was like, yeah, you know, I was just venting, whatever, whatever. She's like, me and my girls just can't stop saying that to one another. And then I was like, eh, you know, I'll try it again. But I never could formulate it into a bit. It was just that one line. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't stop. Oh, she wow. Would, you have to keep doing. 
And so then I was like, you know what, if it's that serious to you. So we were at a show together and I started tinkering around with it at this show that she forced me to do the joke. Really? That's a good friend. Yes. And, and it is- also, it's the kind of thing when someone says something that you relate to or kind of like pierces through, makes everything like snap in, we're like, right away, you're like, oh yeah. yeah. And it's like, they, you're like, you want to hear them keep going with it. Cause you're like, okay, they've like teased me with the insight and now I want to hear more. So she was probably jonesing for more of your thought on that. Yes. And then she, um, but she got me to do it and then I, I started doing it and then, you know, and then it became like a, a cult classic out here on the comedy circuit. Yeah. yeah. John, why don't you just call your dad? <laughs> call your, call I mean, my your dad, dad owes me 20 bucks. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I did it and then it, and then it just, you know, once I started working on it, it kind of took off. Do white women get excited? Is it about all women or white women? It was really about white women. Like mm. the the reason that it upset me, you know, is I think the 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 so me and my ex were kind of at a crossroads, like in the in the same place, kind of career wise. Like mm. where I felt like my career had stalled a little bit, mm. and so had her. She was a she was a model. So my ex was making mm. ten fifteen thousand dollars a day. Damn. So, you know, she's working with Wilhelmina in the city and then her and her agent parted ways because it was like that time in her career. You know what I mean? She's like almost 30 years old. She'd been modeling since she was 15, 16 wow. years old. So, but, but you know, when you go from making ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a day down to some bartender money, do you know what I mean? Then right, it was all relative. Yeah. yeah. But so after that, New York got really expensive. She was really getting stressed out. We went down to Miami. She sold her condo down there, came back here and was like really at a point of, do I really want to stay in New York? I'm going to have to call my dad. I'm going to have to call Yo, my dad. Because here, I relate to that. I just hadn't really thought about that. Cause well, if- here's the, well, here's the crazy part, though. Mm. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't her dad. Her <laughs> grandfather. I got to call my friend's dad. Her grandfather died mm. and her the first installment of this money that her and her brother got was $125,000 two years later it was $250,000 nice but the thing that that made steam come out of my ears was I was like as black people you could be working just as hard and kind of be in the same position as your white counterpart and they have somewhere else to go, somewhere mm. else to call, mm. someplace else to go move in. Mm. Black people, like when we say we're broke, that's it. There's no other number to call. There's no escape hatch. Right. You don't have a hot, you guys don't have the hotline. Right. That, that's there's the no, institutional no historical. Right. That's why when people that's are like, I didn't house. do anything. It was my this and that. And it's like, it's so much more complicated than that. But also that's part of why you can call your dad. Right, right, you know. So when I said it, Tori and she was like, Yeah, my girlfriends, we were thinking that's exactly what we would do. All of the the black people in the room, in particular the black, we just something we ever can stop to think, Oh, I'm gonna call. Like, what are you talking like? Who would even think that? So that's why I was so frustrated. Yeah. I would call my dad so fucking fast about even now, if I feel like someone is being mean to me almost, I'll be like, I want to call my dad. Cause, <laughs> Cause, and he always, he's a math professor. So he always did my homework. So whenever that in school, it started making me go, oh, I don't understand something. So I go home and he would do the work. So it made me even academically be like, like dad, like, you know, they, or someone's, I'm in special ed and I'm getting, I'm, someone's being mean and then he'd be, you know, he'd figure it out. So yeah. I always would be like, yeah, I got like, and my mom wouldn't do anything, but my dad would, he'd like handle it. Yeah. I'd call my dad. Yeah. Get my dad in there. So when you were growing up, there was, I know that you were raised mostly in Denver, but Kansas City, Little Rock, where were you born? I was actually born upstate New York. Mm. Yeah, folks got divorced and my mom um, packed up and moved us all to 
to, to Denver. Do you remember them getting divorced? Like, do you remember how they told you? Oh yeah, we all just <laughs> we all started bawling. Oh it really? Was, oh, it was terrible. Yeah. You weren't? Were you surprised? Totally. Mm, really? I, I we had never. I I asked my brother. I asked my sister. None of us had ever heard them fight, seen them fight. Interesting. Yeah, they weren't that type of like yelling, screaming, throwing, hmm. you know, drunken. Neither of my parents are really drank or or they're neither of them my mom is the yelling screaming type of us when we were younger but my dad is not the raise your voice type of guy you know what i mean so you guys are blindsided oh completely blindsided completely blindsided that's surprising crazy. we had like when we when they lived we lived together when we were little kids we had like the almost like television uh, household, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's three kids. It's like a white picket fence house, upstate New York. You know what I mean? Two cars in the driveway. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really remember all that was going on, but I remember the picture of it. I went back up there, you know, now that I'm older and it's a fucking tiny house, but whatever. But still, from that to the projects in Denver, you're like, mm -hmm. this ain't where we was living, man. Like, what's going on? And can we live with dad? And then, mm. you know, thinking that he still had that house. And my mom was like, no, you know, we're here now. Your dad's going back to New York. And we were just like, this is terrible. <laughs> you know Did I mean? your mom end up telling you why they ended up doing the divorce? No, you know what? I bet she would tell me now. But I mean, mm. now, that, now that we're adults, you can see that they, there was no way that they could have been together. Right. Right. They're just not even, uh, do you know what I'm saying? Because my, my parents fought all the time. So then we kind of had an idea. We were like, we saw it coming. Because then, then my, we got a trampoline. I remember that. When we got the trampoline, I was like, some, they're about to tell us something. They're trying to butter us up. So we got this big trampoline. And, you know, this is how much a little hustler I was. I remember they tell us. And my sister starts crying. And then I asked to go watch a rated R movie. I tried to barter right away. I was like, oh my God, you guys are getting poor. You immediately went in on the guilt. And I was like, "Does it, could I How old are you? A couple years ago. No, I'm just kidding. Um, this, oh. this, I'm just kidding. This, this, it's been a rough quarantine. They, it was, I was probably like third grade, second or third grade. And right away I said, so I wasn't allowed to see rated R movies yet. Whatever age it was, I, I think it was second grade. And then, and then I was like, can I please see Dumb and Dumber? Like it would make me feel better. And my parents are like, what? And I was like, if I could just see a rated R movie like that, it's not that bad. And then they they let me, and that was like when I started, I remember that, I started like hustling kind of right in reaction to to that. But you're, so when you're-, you're manipulate, You took your manipulation button and turned it up. 100%. And that, or maybe that's just how I was like coping with it. So I didn't have to like sit with it. Like I was like, let me get something or distract myself. Or, but right away I was like, went to that. So when you- when you guys get to Colorado, and when I was, I was listening to an interview, we were talking about the different parts of Denver. I didn't know that there was a, people are probably, I didn't know there was a Crip, was there literally a Crip and Blood part of Denver? Or is that like, just yeah. like, really? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, now <laughs> Denver is so gentrified. Right. That it's just, um, I, and I mean, like, I knew what gentrification was when I um, got here to New York because I had seen it at home. Mm. But our where 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 we grew up, and most people don't even know like how bad it was in Denver. People from Denver, like Noah Garden Swartz. Yes. If you ask Noah Garden Swartz, if you ask Dan Soder, if you ask mm. those guys, and you say, "Hey, where did John grow up in Denver?" They'll start laughing. They'll be like, "I know that you think it's you know Denver. I know what the picture you have in your head, but they'll tell you where that dude grew up. We didn't. We did not go down there." Really? Uh, Noah, Noah told me that, yeah, that they told him when he was younger, do not go down there under any circumstances. Don't get off Damn. the highway. Don't, do you know what I mean? Like the, the guys I grew up with used to get after it. Like it was, there's a DJ Quick from Compton. DJ Quick was in the gangbang era. Oh yeah, I have some of his songs. Um, I got some, like two of his songs. I don't remember what they are, but I got Yes, them. of yeah. course you got some DJ yeah. Quick. Google DJ Quick, just like Compton. Is he talking Denver? about Denver? <laughs> just like Compton. 
The last verse is Denver. Hmm. Just like Compton. Everyone's like, is he on something? And then they right. have to go check it out. Hmm. Right. Hmm. And, and the reason he made that song is my boy Fat Mike and then brushed him on stage and hit him with a 40 ounce. I know the guys that got him. That's what I'm saying. Of, so the, and it was full? What's that? It was full of beer? Yeah, they went to the concert to get him. Why? Because that's because that's they were ignorant. Like, right. you know, he's, a, he's a blood. How dare you come here with that shit? They bought tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they specifically bought tickets to sit in the front row so when they got their chance, and they did it. Did they get dragged out by security, or what the hell? Oh, this turned into a melee. That's yeah, fucking pandemonium. Up. Getting yeah. hit by head with a... Yeah, it just it's... turned into a brawl. Did they, they go went... to jail? No. Mm. No. As a matter of fact, so so they, they start skirmishing, right? They run out the, 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 the... He runs off stage. They run out the back of... I think it was called the Ogden Theater. And then everybody just took off in the street. No, they didn't go to jail. That's insane. The guy who... One of the guys who did it, who was there in the front row, you know, you can't, I, I, I'm not snitching because he's right, dead. Of course, of course. Because, right. because, because he's actually dead now. Damn. Yeah, he, he moved to Atlanta with another one of my homeboys, C-Rag, that was his nickname. And he was just here, he was at the cellar, not mm. that long ago, he kicked mm. the, he, him and Mike. You stayed, you stayed friends with them after they, I guess I would have too, I would have been like, oh yeah, I keep grew, them in my back pocket. <laughs> I grew up with these guys, right. they're like family. Right. The, eight, the, the two of them moved to Atlanta together. Mike got shot down there. Like the, the mm. dude that, that, that inspired the song, just like Compton. Mm. My boy. Mm. Yeah. Damn. Like I grew up with the, like it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't what people think. It, our neighborhood was so bad. Again, ask Noah, ask Dan. They tore my neighborhood down. Mm. They bulldozed it. They bulldozed the elementary school. They bulldozed the hospital. They were like, we're going to pretend this this shit didn't happen. Did it's they give gone. you the heads up? Or was there just some bulldozers oh, one no, day? They told us. They said, um, they're, we're building a trolley. And they called it public domain. We were nowhere near the trolley. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, see, so the trolley's got to come through. So you guys are going to have to go. Be like, that seems yeah. kind of like a detour. No, it's going here. It's going over the um, bodega. It's going through everything, actually. Yeah, yeah. that you, that too. Your grandma's house, is, it's got to go through. It's got to speed up, back up. It's going through everything. It's Trolley. all gone. It's all gone. Damn. And, yo, think about this. There, the, so I grew up directly, the, right across the street was an elementary school. How often have you seen a school torn down? Not often. They tore the school down and rebuilt another one in the field where the field mm. was behind the school. They built a new school when the white kids moved down there, tore down the one that you never see schools torn down. Where school was everyone down. supposed to go? Where were you guys supposed to go? By the grace of God, when it was being torn down, it was um, the exact time that I was on my way to Minnesota. Mm. So I was leaving. Mm. And they were like, you have, you know, set amount of time to get out of here and then we're going to tear this down. But I mean, it's gone. Like I said, they tore the school down, the hospital, the schools. I know schools that have been around since the 18, like no one right. tears the school down. You right. Know, and then there's like the whole down. faculty and principal. And then what's he like, I'm guessing they didn't hire him at the other one. Tore it, tore it down. Mm. That's how much they wanted where I grew up. Personally, they wanted the bill gone. They were like, there were stories in the in the papers like why are these 15 16 year old guys driving around in these you know 60 70 thousand dollar trucks right. and cars i mean my boys was moving a lot of dope out of there but then there was a lot of drive-bys and stuff and they were just like mm -mm. did you did you feel angry about that about what that they were tearing everything down like how'd you even process it were you like or was it just more like all right i'm leaving so it is what it is I mean, I think at the time I was like, it is what it is because mm. I didn't know back then what gentrification was. Right. You know, I didn't realize, oh, this is a, this is, this is essentially reverse white flight. Mm. You know, like all those white people's parents, like white people's parents in the 60s, 70s or whatever decided, oh, we're going to move to the suburbs. We're going to get out of here. Right. And then their kids were like, this is whack as fuck. 
we want to move to the city. Right. So then it was just to reverse. Okay, right. well then let's put the black people, put them, put everybody that's uh, of color in the city out. We'll just move. So it was just reverse. You know what I mean? Right. It was like we're oh, back. No, we don't. We don't really like this. Eh, right. Oh, we changed our mind. We screwed yeah, up. We, yeah, we we changed it. Our kids Sorry about that. Like, our kids don't like it here. Yeah. Right. That's right. all it is. Mm. When was the first time you played basketball? I when I was younger. You and were you a tall kid? Like when did you get so tall? Definitely not. Mm. You know, I was so I, I got to high school. This is how I know my exact height. When I got to high John's school, tall. I'm six four now. He's a tall man. Yes. When I got to high school, so we're about to play my first game of the season, my freshman year. And on the you look at the the height and the I think it has your height and your number, mm. your jersey number on the stat sheet. Height, jersey number. So it's I remember looking down at it and it said five ten and I fell out laughing. I was like, five ten. Because <laughs> like, I'm like five seven. Right. You know, my friend, right. I'm like five. So I remember thinking five ten. But every summer I grew like an inch and a half. You just kept growing. Yeah. And I kept, so by the time I came back as a junior, I'm like six two, but I was athletic as Mm. hell. And by then I was, to most of the state of Colorado, I was terrified. And by Mm -hmm. the time I was a senior, people were just, you know, like, there's nothing we're going to do to stop them. So let's worry about anybody else. Did you do focus on academics or are you just totally about playing ball i was totally about playing ball until ball was going to be taken away from me because of the academics right <laughs> right, yeah. right 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 they're like you got yeah. a q in fucking english so yeah. you gotta like circle back <laughs> like yo i failed that i the, the truth of the matter is i failed out of high school because <sighs> First of all, I was violent, and then I was just, I was, I would miss so much class. So what my- What were you violent folks, about? Oh, I was angry. I used to be an angry- Violent? Young dude. Oh, I used to just, I used to get into so many fights. Like with your fists? Yeah. Wow. I was a different guy back then, but I was in a different place. I was in a different- That's environment. crazy. I can't yeah. picture that. I can't picture you being in a fight at all, unless oh. someone, I don't even know, because also- you know, since we've known each other, there have been like situations where many people would have, um, if they were in your situation, would have fought, you know, like, I mean, it was even in, I forget if it was in the New York Times or what, but there was, it was uh, right after Trump's election and someone at Rolling, a, Stone. Rolling Stone about why can't I say the N word and coming at, you know what I'm saying? Almost so, hit that guy. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm sure. Glad. Yeah. I'm glad sure. I did. I'm yeah, glad too. I'm, I'm glad too. I remember there was a show here in New York and somebody There he is. Did I just lose you? It froze. I don't know if it was, I think it was, I don't know if it was my computer or your computer. It's terrible. But he's Sorry back. So there was one time you were in New York City. And this guy's barking out front and he's like, yeah, we got John Laster, whatever. Great comedian. And the dude was like, John Laster from Denver. And the guy was like, oh, John Laster, he's an alcoholic thug. And the dude was like, what? John? <laughs> like, John? Nice John? He was like, man, John used to punch people. And the guy was looking at him like, I think you got the wrong guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another comedian from, <laughs> how did this guy know you? He just had heard of you in Denver? He knew me from Denver. He knew me from the hood. Right. You go, yeah. He's like, that motherfucker. Oh, John, steal your wife, take you out. And you're like, John? Yeah. Mr. Like, Honeybun? John likes honey buns. Mr. Honeybun? Mr. Honeybun? Yeah. Said- oh, yeah, that's a front. But yeah, I was, I was, uh, yeah, I was a bit more violent. And, but the, the truth of the matter is um, that 
I failed, I did fail out mm. of school because I was, I was a different guy. My sophomore year, going into my sophomore year, a new coach came in. So I was like 14 at the time. A guy that I, re he's really the, 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 he's really like the guy that I go to. He's like my dad, mm. my coach from, so he came in the end of my freshman year. But in his contract, he put, the only way that he would take the job is if they let me back into Denver Public School. Oh, so you were like out of the school. Yes. I, I Damn. Think out. And were you like, okay, fine, fuck that, that's it. I'm just going to find another way to play ball or what did, how, what were you, what did you think you were going to do? No, I, I, yo, to be honest with you, back then, I was, you know, I was like, eh, whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't all that serious to me. They were going to send me to the, to the school, you know, where all the bad kids go. It's right. called Metro. But in my mind, to be honest with you, at that point in time, I'll joke in aside, I really was considering Robin Banks. Really? Yeah. I've fantasized about that a bunch of times. Yeah. I was going to rob banks. Hmm. There, there used to be these rolling 60 crypt dudes that would set up shop probably like once every two or three months. They would be in Denver for some reason, a bunch hmm. of them. But they had these blue Mercedes and BMWs and Lamborghinis, and they would pull up in this park over by this recreation center that I used to play at. And everybody was terrified of these guys. I mean, nobody could ever do anything to me because I was the hood athlete. Right. So I never had to worry about somebody putting their hands on me because right. if you did, my boys would shoot your neighborhood up. It, it wouldn't right. be worth it for right. everyone in your neighborhood to die because you punched me. Right, so you got some protection. Leave him off. It's not worth it. Right. But those guys had so much money and mm -hmm. I, so it, in in my head back then when I thought that I was going to fail out of school and all that I was like I'm going to get money one way or another sure and I could damn sure get up on a counter quick enough to you know to, to you already <laughs> I'm the counter guy I'm the counter guy <laughs> yeah you go yeah. into the audition I don't even know what how you get it you're like jumping up and down on stuff and they're like yeah. okay you're yeah. pretty, but you're so tall I feel like you they'd recognize like you go in and then you're so tall that it'd be like an identifiable feature I don't know I had <laughs> I had seriously considered I was like yo I could I could rob I could I could be a, a very smart bank sure yeah how close did you get to, to trying out to do it yeah I mean once once my coach came in mm. and was like I'm not taking the job but then he was on me like in the summers you know because you know there was like I said there was a lot going on where I'm from they they um he he wouldn't he wouldn't let me stay at home in the summer so I had to wow. work at his restaurant in the summer to keep me out of there do you know what I mean and then he was teaching me to drive and this wow. and I just stayed out of the fray and then and then as I got to be a, a sophomore and a junior, he sent me away so that hmm. I would stay out of the hood. So Damn. one summer I had to coach at Pepperdine University hmm. all summer at their basketball camps. I spent the summer out there. And then the following hmm. summer, he sent me away to basketball camp, which is where I got the scholarship. Are you still in touch with this guy? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's my dad. Yeah. Wow. That's a, it's amazing. Like what, cause like also now as we're adults and we see like how much effort it is to do life and all that stuff to think of someone taking the time out of their life and their day to take something on to watch out for someone else it's like that's a lot it's like a father to me man yeah really, he, re he really is coach is like uh like i said he's like a, he taught me to tie a tie drive mm. a car like when i you know needed advice i always i always call him so he was really like my dad little jewish guy hmm. yeah little little jewish guy but hmm. i mean his, his daughter says the same thing like always on his birthday she's like oh my dad this that the other but he also has two like adopted sons right. malcolm and john you know he, that's he cute as his as his sons that's literally. cute yeah did when you went away to college when you i was reading that you did not like your college coach do you think that was because you had such a close relationship with the high school coach so it was like he's not him or what do you think it was no i was i was a really really good basketball player and at my college coach, like he was um, a Mormon guy from Utah. He was Mormon. 
He gave some more wow. Mormon guy from Utah. But I think that he had a picture in his head. I don't know. It's almost like people kind of gravitate toward somebody who's like them that they see doing good. So he just mm-hmm. kind of liked the the nerdy. Um, um, he didn't you know, see himself in you kind of thing? At all. Mm. I, and, 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 and not only did he not see himself in me, I reminded him of all of the people that he despised. Dang. Yeah, I think that I really did. Now, to be fair, because I always like to talk about the part that I played in it, mm. I was beyond <laughs> arrogant. Mm. You know what I mean? You're talking about an 18-year-old, 19-year-old guy who is the most popular, not only guy in his high school, in high school. Right, you're the local this, the local star athlete, so you're the local celebrity. And I mean, I remember we went to a, 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 this gathering in a park called Juneteenth. <clears throat> and we're sitting in this car, my, my, you know, it's the same shit. There's a shootout, a bunch of my dudes, they're throwing their guns in this dumpster. They, because guy, they got to get rid of the gun. Yeah. Yeah. The guy had got shot. His car hits a tree. And my boy's like, Dang. oh, that's so-and-so. And then they did the shooting. Whatever, whatever. We don't need to name names. So these guns are going in the dumpster. I'm waving what's up. You know, hey, what's up? So what's, hey, what's up? So what's up? I'm sitting in the car smoking. Right? And this girl is in the back seat, And she said, and she, I remember her being weirded out. She was like, oh, my God, John. She said, you're not worried at all. And, mm. and my boy sitting in the front seat. He was like, there's a force field around this car. Mm. Like, you know that this guy is the in, in the worst hood in, in Colorado or the bougiest mm. ballroom. John is the dude. So, and the cops weren't giving you any trouble either? No. No. But I mean, I'm just, I'm only saying that to say, I was walking around with that sure. type of ego. Right. You can't touch I'm, me. As I'm dealing with this coach. Right. Who who I don't think much of anyway. I right. still don't. You know what I mean? So I wasn't backing down. If right. I were smarter, I would have just played his game, found my path to the NBA, and never talked to him again. Oh, so I was going to ask if in retrospect you would have done anything differently with the relationship with him. Absolutely. Really? Ab- oh, yeah. Absolutely. If in retrospect, I would have, I would have just played my game, and and found a way to be cordial with him. It's so fucking hard. There's certain things I look at where I'm like, man, if I just, because it's so tough too, because he's disrespecting you. So then oh. it's like, are you just supposed to fucking take it and get disrespected the whole time? And then it's like, is that good for yourself to not stand up for yourself? Because I had a situation where I stood up for myself almost too much and recently I've been reflecting where I'm like you know if I had just kind of just kept it totally in a way that benefited me for work maybe I, that would actually have been good but it's hard it's, it was very hard and 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 so the way that college basketball works and I I think that if I explained it this way this way everyone can understand versus mm. me trying to be nuanced about our relationship I'll give you a, an example the head assistant of every college basketball team is the guy who goes out and finds the players. Mm. So he recruits those players to the university. The head coach then coaches them. Okay, so this guy didn't recruit you himself. Right. The head Mm. assistant did. right? Right. So the head assistant at the University of Minnesota was the guy who brought me to Minnesota. Mm. So we're in the locker room. We look up. Coach Brown is crying, right? So I'm like, hey, coach, what the, fuck, what the fuck is going on? He said, hey, John, I love you. Da, 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 da. But for my family, I have to tell you guys that I'm leaving. Now, once that head assistant leaves, the new head assistant is going to come in with his players. So he's going to be always telling the head coach, not John, put the guy in that I brought. Right, 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 right. It's like when there's like a CEO of a company or something, they want their people to get credit. So they're like, no, no, put them out. I brought them in that did this, even though they piggyback what they were already doing. Yeah. Exactly. So they, oh, are, no. they are going to constantly be fighting to make sure their guys like, right, so right. I transfer, 
So I transferred back to Colorado State because the head assistant at Colorado State, his name was Coach Jackson. Me and Coach Jackson were like this. Mm. We saw eye to eye like nobody else. So it's the last barbecue of the year where we, we had this great barbecue. It was on a big ass fucking property, whatever, mm. whatever. Coach Jackson stands up. He's giving the end of the year speech, starts crying. Oh no! Turns Son of a and bitch! Turns and looks at me, no one else in this in this huge garage room. Because he knew he he knew that's why you came back. Fuck! Why didn't he give you a heads up? And he says to me, he says, "Hey, you know this isn't about you, John." And everybody is is there's an audible gasp, like there's no way in the world this is happening to this guy. Right. Because it rarely happens that the head coach is going to head assistant's going to leave while you're there. Right. Normally they're there 15, 20 years. These head assistants. Right. Right. But for it to happen to you twice, mm. it's like being hit by lightning twice. And my whole team is sitting there like, what did this guy do? Like, how could mm. this happen? And if this happens, you just got here. And now the, the, the other, so all of my teammates are thinking, you're done. We did, all knew I was done on that day. Did you feel like that that made you, is that, did you start to feel less untouchable when that happened? Oh, you're totally un, you're totally touchable when that happened. Damn it. Oh, yeah. Fuck. You're like, I'm getting touched. Yeah. <laughs> no. Teflon gone. And then when you're in the games, they're treating you differently, like they're not putting you in. I just watched no. the Michael Jack. My, the oh my God. Is, my, the, the head assistant is, is now saying, why, he doesn't need to play. Put in mm, someone else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was toast, though. As soon as he mm. stood up and said that, now, of course, the head coach comes over to me, pulls me outside and says, hey, John, we know what everybody thinks. We all, everyone thinks that you're done, essentially. Because maybe the next coach you would have really liked. Maybe it could have been, or did you already know who was coming in? No, 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 no. The, he, the head coach was still there. Oh, but the other, I got it, I got it. The guy that brought you in again, that guy. Right. right. The guy who oh. brought you in was the one who was leaving. So then it's like you and the head coach are looking at each other and you're like, Fuck. yeah. And the head coach already hated me. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if the head assistant is there because he's going to keep going to bat for me. Right, 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 right. But you're once right. he said, hey, I'm leaving, I'm going to Stanford, that new head assistant mm. is going to be like, hey, coach, fuck him. You right. don't like him anyway. Right. Put my guy in. Right. And that's what happened. Why'd the head coach not like you? I, he, I think that I reminded him of all of the guys that, that he was intimidated by. Mm. You know this is mean? a different person than that other one. Yeah, than the first coach. The mm. second, the first coach did like me, but the head assistant left. So I was like, I'm going to go. Right, right. I know I can play. I, me and this head assistant love each other. And then he left. And then I was, and you can't transfer anymore. Now I'm re, now the head assistant, the head coach at that second place really knew he had me by the ball. You have nowhere to go. Did you feel depressed? Oh, completely. Mm. Completely. Oh, yeah. How'd Absolutely. you cope? Uh, a lot of E&J. What's E&J? <laughs> Eating and jacking off? <laughs> Yo, I'm going to steal that. It's, it's, a, it's, a hood, it's a hood brandy called E&J. Oh. Oh, I didn't know about that. Well, yeah, when I was listening to, well, when I was listening to your interview with um, Mike Bigley and he was talking, you guys open it and you're talking about that sometimes John would eat 10 honey buns at the most I was like but I did know you had a sweet tooth would you oh, cope would did this did you start coping with using sugar when you stopped drinking or were you were you drinking E&J and eating honey buns back then no just the E&J yeah yeah it was just just E&J that we would put in the freezer mm. right before practice and mm. We would sit it on the counter right after practice, let it thaw down a little mm. bit, and then. So you night. would drink while you were playing ball too. It wasn't like when you stopped oh. playing ball, then. I was. We were fucked up the whole time. But I mean, you got again. You know, you're 19, 20. You can run all day. I know it's crazy. All it's day. crazy. And I would be up, crazy. We would have two days, so sometimes we would have to practice before class. I, well, one of the interviews you were talking about how you were not a morning person, but you had to be doing up all the time training to be a semi-pro athlete. So maybe you're just burnt out from having to train in the mornings. 
Well, we would get up only for two a days, but then after mm. that, once two a days was over for a couple of weeks at the beginning of the year, um, then it was just class. But right. then, but the truth of the matter is, I just I just didn't even go to those classes. Because you're depressed. No, I just didn't feel. I never was a like I said when I say I'm not a morning person. I would just mm. I'll just sleep in. Who cares if I fail right. the class? I mean, we right. were ball players. They work it out. Right, right. They'll figure it out. Some kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, thing. yeah. They'll they'll figure out. How was com? Would you say? Did you notice as you started doing moving on and stand up that there were similarities to basketball? Like, are there any parallels between trying to go pro in basketball and trying to go pro in comedian as a comedian? besides the fact that they're both really fucking hard. Like those are two very hard one at one in a billion, you know, one in two trillion type things. You know what? I think that the, I think that sports have, have allowed me uh, a favorable life because mm. my, the, the, the coach that I consider my father really ingrained in me obviously my mom did too but it wasn't because my mom's my everything and just watching my mom but my mom wasn't one of those people who would sit down and say hey you have to she would say do your homework right my coach would say these are the habits that you must maintain if you're going to be who you want to be as a mm. ball do you know what like I mean? Explain also why you need to do your homework and how you do your homework and yeah. 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 My mom was just like, do your goddamn homework or, you know, don't right. be a dumbass or, you know, this, that, the other. My, my mom was a disciplinarian, even though I was getting in trouble. I know she had to just be throwing her hands up at some point in time. And her, sister was a psych- and her sister was a psychotherapist? Her, my aunt was like a psychoanalyst. Psychoanalyst. What? Is, what the? Heck, what is that? It's some insane level of schooling that you go to. Sounds and, like it. Yeah, you become some whatever. But I mean, I felt like after a while, you know, after we were in the hood for a while, like my cousins wouldn't. In all fairness, like in hindsight, as I look back, like when I tell you that people would not come down there, mm. like my cousins wouldn't come down there anymore. And then I got resentful toward my whole family. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of felt like our whole family was like, uh, you know, they're down there. Sure. You know, we don't really want it. Now, of course, after on my way out of there, then I became the guy. Then it was like, oh, let's go to his games. Let's mm. this. John is that. Uh, and by then I was done. Because you, know you were mean? like, it felt like transparent. Like, you didn't come see me back then. Yeah, I hate that. I, you like Drake said, I you hate that to be in the gym. I didn't want anything to do with those people. By I hate that also too because it's so transparent. Also, it's like, do you think I didn't notice? Do like you, that's the other thing. All you those like, years, and you all think those. I'm so stupid. Well, do you remember that Martin Lawrence joke? Did you see that special he had where the girl's like grinding on him, and she's like, I don't know what it is about you, and he's like, It's not this hundred grand in my pocket, right. is it? Right. It ain't got nothing to do with this hundred thousand in my pocket. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like you think I'm so stupid that you would be that like I wouldn't be like, Oh, it's like, what well, do you think I wouldn't put it together? The two, the you didn't come then, and you do come now. Like that's right. almost the most insulting aspect of it because it's like. You don't don't treat me don't make me feel like I'm stupid. Right, right. But that's what it was. Right. I also had the benefit too of going through. So when you come the the comedy versus basketball thing, I broke my hand my first day of practice my senior year. I'd mm. already signed, so I wasn't in any jeopardy of not having right. scholarship, whatever, whatever. What so it wasn't about about that. But I remember not playing the difference the way that people treated me when I wasn't playing first. Interesting. So I got a quick glimpse into Interesting. that very early on. You know was that mean? the first time that you had had that? That was my first glimpse at how fast the lights cool. Isn't that the truth? It's so interesting too because it's like it's just like you can never get it twisted. And sometimes you'll see someone that hasn't had that realization yet. And you're yeah. like, no, you don't get it. No matter, even if the trajectory is all straight up, it's going to be like up. Like the stock market has gone up over the past bunch of years, like on average. But there's times when it's like down and it's up and it's down. And it's up yeah. and it's down. So when you see someone that hasn't, like is being super cocky with that, you're like, ah, this is, 
it's not going to go well when it comes back down because yes. you're an ass. How did you deal with it when you, when you started seeing people treat you differently? And also it's just cause you're, it's like, it's not even like you fucked up. You're just not playing right now. Right. I mean, lucky for me, my friends have always, my close friends have always been my friends and they, Good. and they still are. The Great. greatest compliment ever paid to me was after, you know, hand got better, whatever. And then I moved on to Minnesota and, you know, you're doing the press and all that. But even after my, my college career was over, I think one of the greatest compliments, I, I came home and I'm sitting there. This is right after I come home from college. My friends rent this truck. They get, come get me, get all my shit. We go back down to Denver. And I'm about to move to New York, try to do comedy. And mm. one of my friends said, hey, man, you know, I know things didn't work out, whatever, whatever. And one of my friends said, you know what? The, the There were some, some girls there because, you know, it's a, it's a, a welcome home soiree right. whatever and uh and um and one of the girls said yeah you know that must have been tough whatever and one of my friends said yeah you know but for a long time he was the shit and he said but you never changed mm. and that like oh he said you never he said i he said he said to be honest with you if you would have i'd have been like oh, he's big time now he says he said you all, watching you through that whole time, you said I was waiting for the the day where you was going to mm. be like, oh, now I hang with these guys, or now right. I'm, I know. don't go down there either. Right. 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 What place right. are you talking about? Right. Right. <laughs> he said I was wondering when you was going to come through with the puppy and the and the and right, 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 right. monocle and the yeah. monocle with the smoker's jacket on and stop talking to us. But he said, <laughs> said you never changed. Never, yeah, that is a huge compliment too. That's the greatest compliment I think ever. It is you. because that's a testament to character. You know, yeah, but I, that's the character. That, that you, you won't, you'll never shit on the people that you love. Mm -hmm. That's what it meant to me. Like, you know, the dudes, and he said, man, I, he said, if you would have, he said, I don't know that I would have judged you because mm -hmm. all that energy that used to be around you, you know, and then you got to, you got to put your shit in a box and come to New York where no one knows you or oh, starting out going from going from being a professional. Cause I always think of it in New York, it's everybody starting over no matter what. So the, the more um, accolades or the better your life is or the, all that stuff makes the juxtaposition harder. Cause no matter what New York is really hard. I don't know if I wouldn't would have been able to do it if I hadn't, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. Cause I, I mean, I was there and then I moved away and then I, it's a real, it really is fucking tough. But I always think the people where I'm like, and this is not even them as athletes, like for, for comedians, I'm like, before you get too big in your city, get out because yeah. you don't, any sense of comfort is going to make it even more of a just fucking brutal yes. experience. Make a run for it. Make a run for it. And that's why I didn't start comedy in Denver. Really? Oh, I was already the dude. The right. last thing you want to do is sit there and keep being the dude and right. then be a little funny and be like, you know what? I'll just stay here and keep right. with my Royal Oats. I got on the first thing cooking. Mm. Like, let's get to the base of Mount Everest. I don't mm. even want to play around out here. Was yeah. it harder than you thought it would be? Um, Much harder because you always yeah. think, oh, in five years I'll yeah. be, you know, oh. I'll have my own TV show. I'll just stack together. I remember taking a comedy class and there were three of them and it was when I very first started and I was like, they each cost, I think, $400. So I, was, I remember being like, I'm gonna take the first one and then I'll work and then I'll take the second one and then I'll work and I'll take the third one. So in between working and this, that'll be like eight months and then I'll be a professional comedian. And I had like mapped that out and I told, I like, was telling people that I was like, well, I'm doing open mics now, but I'll be pro and I guess about eight months yeah. is when I'll be, I'll have graduated the program and fucking... You're like, you're like, <laughs> this is not even, but you want, I mean, then you get to the New York, there's, it's impossible to ever feel like you're at the top of New York, I think, but you can get, I feel like you can get as far as you can get as a comedian separate from, so it's like you can, there's certain things you do where, you know, I think basically the comedy seller is the top of it. And then other than that, it's like, okay, then you're just uh, like trying to do social media stuff. But in terms of actual stand up, then the top, you know, get to the top of that. What yeah. was it when you won stand up for diversity? There was a quote you had where you, afterwards you said, I felt like I did, uh, you did, I did my best. Like, I felt like I, what do you feel like prepared you to do your best in that 
moment? Like, how did you get your head in that space where it was like, I don't care what the outcome is, but I did my best. And for context, Stand Up for Diversity is a um, giant showcase that NBC puts on. More than a showcase. It's a giant contest and then you win a development deal. Nationwide contest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, again, I will tie that back into basketball. Mm. Because there, there's an expression in that, that um, most athletes, any athlete that played at a really high level, and damn sure for um, basketball, and the expression is leave it on the floor. Mm. As long as you come back into the locker room after the game is over with, and you don't have anything left, as long as you gave it everything you had out there. Oh my God, that's totally I, not how I first interpreted that. I thought it was like, no matter what, or maybe, okay, this is maybe totally wrong, but is it, I thought at very first, so it's not like no matter like what you did the night before or all that, as long as you are okay when you're on the floor, then it's okay? Or does it, it means like, no, you just need to work as hard as you can. I thought it was like a pass, like you could, no, okay. No, no matter how fucked up you get the night before, as long as you're good once you hit the court, yeah. you're good. <laughs> no, damn, fuck. No, no, no. Bad interpretation. No, what it means is um, <laughs> give it everything right. you got when got you're it. out there on the court. Got it. And no matter what the end result, you should be able to sleep with it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So the reason I broke my hand the first day of practice my senior year is just to let the the younger guys know what it was going to take to win. Mm. I would win every single line, every every line that we had to run, every time the mm. folks would blow the whistle and we had to run a lap or something, I would make sure that I won every single one mm. from the start to finish of practice. Set the president. Oh, yes. So there's a guy who's saving some of his energy so that he can win one at the end of practice. Motherfucker, get in your head. And I, I mean, good game plan, though. I'm not going to lie. That's pretty. Oh, I was so mad, though, Emma. Yeah, of course. You're like, I know what you did. Yes, exactly. So he's, he's saving it for this last. <laughs> oh. Kit Kat's in the corner. Like, <laughs> yeah. wait till that last one, John. Wait. <laughs> As he throws the rappers in the yeah, court. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're, we're, we're backpedaling, which is the last lap of practice. And he's getting close. Mm. And I was like, fuck that. I mm. dove backwards. I just jumped as fast as I could backwards to, to get over the line to make sure that I was <gasps> Yes. And went to, catch my, went to catch myself, broke my wrist. Oh. slowest healing bone in your body is your navicular bone inside your wrist. Yeah, you're not supposed to dive backwards. You're not supposed to dive backwards and uh, and break your wrist. But mm. that is that is the definition of leaving it on the court. Mm. You give it everything you got, and on your way to the locker room, you can sleep like a baby. Right. And that's the way I played. That's the way I practiced. And then also, oh. it doesn't matter so much if you technically win or lose, if you... I right. gave it everything yeah, I yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that I gave it everything I had. So with the stand-up NBC competition, I'm out there. What can I do to make sure that I'm as prepared as possible? So right. my buddy, Leslie Jones, comes to get me mm. to go to the club the night before. And was so, this one before she had... Not that it makes a difference, but just picturing it in my head. was Had she gotten SNL before no. then? No, she hadn't gotten it yet. She, she, she got it immediately after. Wow. Yeah, immediately after. So she comes to get me. This way I know where the club is. I know where the lights are. I was super comfortable. It's so fucking important to do that. When I, I auditioned at the... Really yeah, see, it makes... When when I auditioned at the cellar, I didn't know where the light was. I didn't know where anything was. And Gary Goleman took me downstairs and pointed it all out. And he even said, this is how you walk to the stage. Go around this. But it's a huge... Because otherwise you would have gotten to the venue and been like, look, taking it all in. So you went ahead of time. I went there all the night in. before. So by the time I got on stage the following day, I was comfortable as hell. Mm. I remember after that, you get meetings with NBC. So you meet with casting, you meet with, you know, whatever, development, whatever. So we go to meet with them the next day. And I remember Gina Brion asking me, she said, hey, John, who do you think won the competition? But 
my mindset when I'm competing is to leave it all on the floor. I'm not the judge of this competition. My job is one thing, leave it on the floor. Mm. After I said, thank you, good night, I literally, I was done. I had really. Checked. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about who had won that No overthinking. No, I said this. I should have said that. I, left I was prepared. Mm. I knew which jokes I was going to do. I nailed them. The rest of that is up to y'all. Right. I had left it all on the floor. Right. I'm done talking about this. Now Why I'm is it so hard to do that? Do you, do you think that, that isn't that, I feel like that can be very difficult to, to do. I, I think it, 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 it was years of training. Right. You train that way for, for years and you get up every morning and, 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 and it was years of training to teach myself to, 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 to prepare and, and compete that way. But once you do, you really can, you really can give it all you got and be done if you right. give it up for that. Right. Yeah. Cause it's a way to also not let yourself like wallow in self doubt. There's this actress I was talking to and she said, Gabrielle Ruiz, and she said that after she does an audition, she gives herself one block to think about it, and then that's it. She goes, no overthinking about it. She goes, I did it. I did the best I could, I hope, and if I didn't, I'll correct it, but I have one block to walk around. She's like, sometimes I can walk around the, I can walk around the block a couple times, but after that, that's I found, it. I found myself doing using that same approach in my Meisner class. So we would mm. come in, we would have a scene, when I first got to class, I didn't understand the level of commitment. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready sometimes before class, whatever. The scene would go shitty. And I loved my teacher in the class so much that if she didn't like it, I would be devastated. Totally. I know exactly what you mean. When you want, yeah. when you like someone you, and they're rooting for you. And so you don't want to let yes. them down. Yeah. And I would be devastated. But then, you know, as I watched other people prepare and learn what I had to do, I was like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to walk out of there like that. Mm. So then when I started preparing and doing everything that I needed to do, even on the days that it didn't go as well as it could have, I knew that I had, I left it all, right. in, that's all I had. I can grow from there, but I genuinely, if I genuinely, genuinely really did everything I could, you should be able to sleep good. If you know in your heart. Yeah. There's a couple times where I felt like I've like done that. And then there's a lot of times where I'll like think about it too much afterwards. <laughs> but there's a couple times where I really have been like, I don't care what the outcome is because I did everything I could. So that's out of my, you know, right. That's out of it. But I mean, the yeah. proper, the proper training and anything that you do is to keep increasing the percentage of times that mm. you know for a fact. Mm. And the people that we see that are the so-called maestros and this, that, the other, most of the time, the difference between them isn't some skill set. You know, Kobe Bryant didn't possess this, this magical thing. He, what, he didn't even start when he got to the NBA. He wasn't like mm. LeBron or Michael Jordan. But what he did do is leave it all on the court mm. every single time. They tell us, they, as ball players, they should tell us, if you shoot 500 shots a day, if you go to the gym and get up 500 shots a day, Jesus you, Christ, that's a lot of it, shots. It is a lot of shots. That's a, oh, that's Emma, it's so that's many a shots. lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. But if you have the skill set and you have, you know, if, if you're NBA athletic, which I was, and I right. went to the gym and I shot 500 shots a day, you are giving yourself a ridiculously good chance to go to the NBA, but you got to mm. get those 500 shots up. Kobe shot a thousand. Right. So, is there any mystery why this guy was what he was? Because if you look, people have this picture in their head that he was that when he came into the, he mm. wasn't. But a thousand shots a day eventually will separate you from the rest of us. Isn't it interesting too, because sometimes when people get impressed well, where they think some, and how I'll relate it to is entertainment, like someone will be like, wow, you know, that thinking like a set is really cool or something. I'll go, I'll be like, yes, you know, it's pre-scripted. So I was like, so the thing that's almost amazing about it isn't just that it's so good and funny for that amount of time. It's actually the amount of work that it's, what impresses me is the amount of work that goes in. So it is something to be impressive, but don't necessarily be impressed that this person came up with this comedy off the top of their head. The thing that's impressive is the refining and the commitment and the sacrifice and all of that. That's where, but sometimes when you, when you, 
hear about that that is what it takes then it's like we all that's where our all of our personal responsibility comes in so it's like damn he wasn't just naturally better at that i mean i'm sure he had a lot of natural something but oh, i'm not and, and, and i'm not saying that kobe didn't have some gifts that other people don't not have. at all we yeah then kobe Bryant, we wouldn't be having a discussion about right him. there's nothing to me more dismissive than when when i hear like comedians who don't know my story say something like Oh, John was always funny. Mm. That's, that's just dismissive. That's like, mm. oh, that's almost like he stumbled on this success. Of course. That's it was, interesting. It was to it, right. Which is the most nonsensical thing. It's like, wait a minute. You don't remember that I used to host four bar shows a week? Right. Nobody wants to talk about that. Right. That right. I promoted four shows in Brooklyn a week Oof. to fill them up so that I would have stage time. Right. Did any of y'all have four bar shows that you hosted every week? Right funny get the fuck out of here i now, what, wanted my ass what if okay because sometimes if someone says oh you're such a hard worker then that act so then that annoys me sometimes because i'll be like so what you don't think i'm naturally talented that's how i'll take that yeah. so if someone hard was like worker. oh john's such, such a hard worker would that annoy you <laughs> john's a hard worker that's a nice way of saying it. you're not that funny that's what i think that's exact because i'm like i know some other motherfuckers that i'd say they're a hard worker when i'm avoiding the truth but people have, in, I've gotten introduced to that before. Go, oh, no, I mean, not, a, okay. I think it was once or twice. So I'm kind of blowing it out of proportion. But <laughs> someone, one, once or twice, someone has said like, oh yeah, like you're such a hard worker. And I don't take, I don't like that either. That's what, that's one step over saying he's so polite. What the fuck? Man? What the fuck? Yeah. What business are we in? But so it's hard to give comedians a compliment too. Like when, so, you know what I'm saying? Very true. Because if someone Very said you were a hard worker, you wouldn't like that either, right? I would not like that. Yeah. <laughs> I would not. You're always funny. That. Oh, you think I'm not a hard worker? You're such a hard worker. Oh, you don't think I'm funny. <laughs> you trying to call me a hard worker? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What's a compliment someone can give a comedian? Oh, uh, great set. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's true. And it, and it looks like you worked for it. Mm. <laughs> uh, that's true. Great set is... Great set is, uh, that is nice. That is, that will never re not be nice to hear. No, we'll take it. We'll take it. Well, where can people find you online and keep up with all your stuff? Obviously we're all in lockdown, so. Um, you know what? I have been working on my social media like a madman. You've been at that for, a, you've been really doing, you've been at that, um, uh, posting sketches and videos. That's great. Yes, and I'm working on the John Laster Challenge right now, which is testimonials about bad run-ins with cops. Mm -hmm. The day I had my man um, D.L. Hewley send me a video, which is really great. one of the original kings of comedy. He was like, wow, oh, that's a great idea. I want to be a part of that. Oh, my God. I posted it. I'm also posting this week um, some WNBA players, some NBA players who are sending me videos now. Great. So, it's starting to take off. That's awesome. D.L. Hughley sent you one? Yes. That's D. 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 huge. D.L. went up today. He, he wow. Texted me, he texted me last night like, yo, John, did you get the video? And I'm sitting there. Right? I'm so weird. And I'm so creeped out that he really sent it that I right. kept checking to make sure that it, it was still working. Like, like right. it's already on my phone. Like, what are right. you doing? Right, right, right. <laughs> And like I can call me before I post it this morning, like, hey, right. John, no, let's not do that. So, yeah, totally. Yell Hewley City Road. But a lot of people freaked out, text me this morning, like, yo, is that DL Hewley on Right. Yeah, yeah, DL sent me, uh, sent me a video. So, um, but yeah, there's there's some cool people that are going to um, be on there. So, I hope. Awesome. Out. Yeah. John Laster um, Challenge. Well, thank you so much funny. for. Oh, say, say it again. again. He was funny. I put it in the corner, one of these corners. So that's fucking smart to do. Where you put your name for the Zoom, John put his Instagram. That's clever. Yes. Good thinking. Yes. Well, thank you for doing the show, John. I appreciate it. I love you. All right, I'm going to end it right there. Boo. Wait, wait. <laughs>